Today I'm chatting to Tanya from, from Psyche and I'm, I'm incredibly grateful and I think um, you, know, you guys are going to find this conversation very valuable because it's something that, you know, that, that I, I get asked from students all the time. And so you know, following the theme of people sort of wondering whether they're too old to go back and study or change career paths and you know, whatever in their life, um, Tonya has the unenviable job of dealing with RPL at Psycho, which is a recognition for prior learning. So thank you very, very much for joining us today. I really, really appreciate your time. And can you give us a little bit of a background on, on what you do and what RPL is? Okay. So um, I'm responsible for the training program at Psycho. So the 700 and currently 10 training offices that we have. Um, and Recognition of prior learning from a training program perspective is really looking at prior work experience. We don't focus so much on academic learning when it comes to the training program, but anything that would be relevant, for example, if you have worked previously as an accountant or you've had some kind of financial management experience, perhaps you've been in an audit firm, but you haven't actually been a trainee. Um, all of that could be counted towards recognition of prior learning from a psycho training contract perspective. Right. So what is, the, what is the maximum RPL that I could get if I managed, you know, we'll discuss how that goes about. If I managed to tick all the little boxes, what is the maximum RPL that I could get? Um, so you know, ideally, what is the minimum articles that I could do if, if I shifted careers? Okay. So that, that is not as straightforward a question as you might think it is. Um, if you are going into a training contract, the training regulations allow you to get recognition for any time that you've been spent under a training contract previously. Right. So let's say you spent a year and it was in like 2005, it still right. counts as work experience under a training contract. And let's, let's say it was 18 months, you can get recognition of that 18 month period. Okay, but there's a, there's a, there's a caveat there, which I'll, which I'll come yeah. to. If you have done any other kind of work that is relevant towards the training contract, you can get recognition up to 12 months for that experience. Up to 12 months. So that is, even if I've been working as a financial manager at R&B, for example. Like Correct. But you might want to go a completely different route. So I will talk to you about the completely okay. different route. Yeah. But if you're going into a training contract, you would be able to reduce it by 12 months okay. plus any work that you've gained under training contract previously and you can apply for both. So the, the applications yeah. are separate, but you can apply for both of those. Right. So I did my, I did some articles quite a few years ago and then I moved into a, another company and I've been working there. So I will get some time, you know, I'll get time from the articles that I did and separately I'll also get time from that. And again, the reason I ask this is because I, I do have people contact me and they go, you know, I've been working as a financial manager for 10 years. Can I yeah. wipe out my entire, you know, can I wipe out my entire training contract with that? Like, yeah. can I get it all signed off that I never actually have to do articles? And the answer yeah. to that is? No. It is yes, but it's okay. not the recognition of prior learning route. Ah, so, okay, okay. I'm going to ask if we can just stay with recognition. Yes, of absolutely. Prior learning okay, so, so the point is there's a, there's a different path for that. It's not called <laughs> RPL. And we'll talk Correct. about that just now. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's stick with RPL. So I just, I want to come back to the caveat, which I yeah. said was there. So the person that is responsibility, whose responsibility it is for recognizing prior learning is the training officer of the office where you register your training contract. Okay. So Psyche does not do the recognition. Okay. So even if you've been under a previous training contract previously, the training officer will assess you have a look at your competence against the current competency framework and also their expected levels for a trainee coming in. I'm going to say at the level that you would be coming in at. So let's say you had a year's experience previously. Let's say it was quite a while ago. You come into the new contract. Some things have changed. This office is also different. They operate differently. So they will then assess where you're at compared to their expected levels of competence. They'll look at the other trainees in their office where they'd expect you to be. And then they would calculate how many months they can give you off your training contract. Okay. So it may not be the full period. And yeah. that's what I'm saying yeah. up to. So up yeah. to 12 months and up to the whole period of the training contract that you were previously right. registered on. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. obviously they're saying if you want to come in here as a second or a third year clerk. Right you need to be able to hit the ground running as one of our second year clerks would. Exactly. You need to be able to add the same value as one of our second year clerks. So it's not so much, 
And I think that's, you know, that's possibly a little bit of a perspective misunderstanding that students have mm -hmm. is that when you come into an organization, they're going, what value can you add? You know, can you do what we need you to do? What you've yeah. done in the past, that's fantastic and all the rest of that, but mm -hmm. can you do what we need you to do at the level mm -hmm. you know, that, that we need you to do it? Um, okay, so the training, the training office itself. So if I, you know, if I decide you know, I'm going to do my articles at you know, Bob's audit firm, mm -hmm. they're going to be the ones who assess whether or not that's not. Okay, but how does that work then if I'm saying I want to do my articles, but I don't want to resign from my current position until I know what that RPL would be. I mean, do I have to apply, change, go and start working for the firm and then, you know, assume like, okay, well, we, you're going to start working as a first year clerk until we've sorted out your RPL stuff and then we'll shift you. So in other words, like I can't really do this while I'm working for another company and wait until the outcome. You know, I, I'm loving the questions because they, they're hypothetical, but, and usually I'd be able to ask the individual for their <laughs> particular circumstances. <laughs> but there are a number of things that are coming up right. for me. The, the first thing is that perhaps the place that you're working is already a psycho-accredited training office. Yeah. For example, a lot, let's say you're working in a bank. A lot of the banks are psycho-training offices. Yeah. Or you're working in commerce and industry. A lot of uh, commerce and industry um, entities are psychotraining offices. So that is one of the potential ways that you can get onto a psychotraining contract and still be in the organization that you're in currently. So that's right. the one thing to consider. Right. Your question around would you have to go in? Yes. If you're going to go into a psychotraining contract, for that person to be able to assess you, they need to see you working. And we usually think that it takes between six to 12 months to assess somebody for recognition of prior learning. Mm. Uh, the training regulations will likely be adjusted shortly to allow 14 months for the application to happen so that the training officer has a full two, what we call um, ANA cycles, which is our assessment process. We have six monthly cycles where we do a summative assessment. Yeah. It gives them two full periods to do the assessment and then make a decision about how much time they can allow. Yeah. So I think it's important that we actually talk about the other route because yeah. I think that, yeah, that I think my, <laughs> yeah, my, my hypothetical, I, I, I hear you, my hypothetical questions are based on all the emails I get from students all the time going, you know, I work as a financial manager at XYZ company, which yeah. they're not psycho credited at all. And mm. um, I'll only make my decision of going back mm. if I know what my salary is going to be and if I know how long, because I only have a year, you know, and because I've been working for 10 years, surely I should be, you know, I'm able to do all this stuff. So mm. from my perspective, like, I don't see why they wouldn't do it. So I think it's important for them to realize you know, they're kind of asking me as though, can they send their application in and sit in their current job and wait until, mm. you know, the answer comes back and then move straight into third year article mm. position. That's, mm. that's what their understanding is of, of how this process works. Okay. Okay. So the other, the other path then. So the only way around a psycho training contract is to apply for exemption. Okay. So that means that you're actually applying to exempt, let's say you did a year previously, you want to get the other two years off, or you've done no training contract previously, and you're basically saying, I've been working in the industry for 20 years, yeah. I, I believe, and often it's in quite senior positions, um, we find that we, the, the applicants for exemption have been in very senior positions, either in an internal audit department or a financial management position, or in an advisory capacity, and really they, they have, by another route, achieved all of those competencies. Yeah. Yeah. But that that application requires at a minimum 72 months of relevant experience. So it is a longer period of time than a, a standard enough. training contract. Yeah. And they have to have passed the ITC. So they've already got to have passed the initial test of competence. That means they've finished their the academic qualification mm. and passed that first exam of psychers and then they can apply for exemption. Right. If they're studying, I'm taking it that they already have the intention of qualifying as a CA. So that would mean staying in their position for a bit longer, completing the studies, writing and passing the exam, and then making the exemption application. Okay. Yeah, because I think, yeah, most of the people who contact me, generally they'll do the two side by side. You know, yeah. mo most of them have a degree, they've got the degree, and they're going, okay, I think it's time for me to pursue my qualification that I left for whatever reason. Um, and so next year I'm going to start CTA, you know, next year I'm going to apply for PGDA. And then at the same time, I may as well 
start my articles. Well, you know, what will that look like? So you're saying for that person, finish your PGDA, finish CTA, write ITC, and then apply for exemption after that process. But I also want if to you say, meet, not, yeah. yes, if you meet the criteria, and also remember that the application for exemption is not guaranteed. Mm. Whereas a training contract, if you work at it and you, mm. and you move through it, you've got a much better chance of actually qualifying. Mm. So you're looking at the difference between starting now and doing two years effectively on a psych training contract. I'm saying if you assume yeah. that the 12 months gets recognized yeah. or waiting and there's a little bit more uncertainty around it, yeah. um, but you can apply for exemption and that is also right. a possibility. Right. These type kind of, what types of things are you commonly seeing people applying for that you're like, you don't stand a chance? <laughs> so yeah. our, our um, exemption application route is very structured. Um, right. It requires two what we call elective competencies. So you're looking at, let's say you've done accounting, and mm. that is always a core competency. You have to have accounting. And let's say there's, um, you've had a little bit of internal audit experience and you've had a little bit of financial management experience. Okay. Right. When I say a little bit, it still needs to be at an advanced level. So what you're talking about in terms of entity size, I, I don't believe is really relevant um, okay. because if you look at our training offices, there's also a very wide range of training offices. Yes. And right. often in a smaller space, you see more. Mm. Whereas in a larger entity, you see an aspect of it right so it's not to say the entity size it's more the kind of experience that you've had right. so our current competencies run in five different elective areas external audit mm -hmm. risk management and governance which is effectively internal audit right. taxation financial management and management decision making and the exemption route requires you to have two of those elective skills and the compulsory which is accounting and financial reporting okay. Yeah. as well as all the professional skills that we mm. that we expect mm. the professional skills for somebody who's been working for a long period of time is often easier to do than for a, yeah. for a trainee because they're still in that development phase right. but what is easier under the training contract is that you only need one elective skill mm. and the office is constantly working with you and developing you in that area mm. when you're going the exemption route it's assumed that you've had to do all of this on your own and you've got to prove that you meet every task within that competency. Mm -hmm. So it really is working through our assessment process from, uh, from uh, you know, in a, in a training contract and saying, I'm applying what I've done in the past 20 years and this is where I actually got that, that experience. All right. And so then would I then have to create like a portfolio? For, for yes. this? So the documents, yes. So you, when when you come to Psych and say I'd like to apply for exemption, first we see if you're eligible. We ask you about the ITC. We ask you about your experience, and then we will give you an applicant's guide with all of the competencies that you need to measure yourself against, and we'll give you specific templates that you need to use. So it really does set out quite a nice structure, mm -hmm. and it just helps the the assessors that will then look at that to assess you against those competencies with, with ease. And also it's then a similar approach for everyone. They're not receiving a CV from one and several bits of corroborating right. evidence from somebody else. And yeah, yeah. so that yeah. it is quite a structured approach. Yeah. So anybody who is interested in that could just, you know, drop us an email and we can send them that information. And then they can see what the structure looks like. And then I would be able to make a bit of a better assessment of myself, how many of those I actually yes. you know, am able to do versus go, okay, I'm not as qualified as I thought, or maybe I'm, I'm more, you know, I reach more. The, the, competence that you, the competencies that, that you talk about, I think um, these are the same competencies that you get signed off if you go to a training contract. It would be, yes. so the, the idea is that when you come out of the process, you should be able to um, do the same stuff that someone who's just, you know, who's come out of their training contract is. So, I think um, for, for, for people who haven't been in the formal article industry, can you, can you explain what a, competency, what a competency is and how it would be measured um, and in terms of the practicalities of it for someone who's sort of never worked within articles or within internships? Yeah. Um, let me think of... I'm going to... I'm, I'm thinking of a very arbitrary um, <laughs> professional, professional skill, okay, that, that yeah. gets measured. Can you lead an effective meeting? Okay, so now you're a brand new trainee out of university. You've never been in a work environment. <laughs> so that requires some skill. First, you'll participate in meetings, which is another competence. Yeah. And then eventually, as you get further along, you'll be actually running the meetings yourself. 
Mm. And the, the office, in terms of determining what kind of things would make it effective, would look at the end-to-end -end process. So you're starting the meeting, you're chairing the meeting. Are you giving everyone an opportunity? Are you keeping things on track? Are you covering the agenda items? So they would... Each office would have probably a slightly different approach, yeah. but I really, by the end of it, no matter what meeting you step into, would you be able to run that meeting efficiently right. and effectively? Yeah. Yeah. So we start. We have a four-point rating scale when it comes to um, the assessment process in a training contract. One means that you haven't been able to demonstrate, and it really means that you've been given the opportunity, and even with a lot of coaching and guidance, you haven't been able to meet that that competency. Okay, and that sometimes happens when you're in your, you know, early on in your contract. Yeah. And even with some with some competencies which people just have a little bit more of a struggle with than mm. than others. Mm. Level two means that you were able to do it, but with quite a bit of coaching and guidance and perhaps some fundamental upfront explanation. So you weren't able to just go into it yourself and then ask questions. Somebody actually had to show you exactly what Take to do. Take you by the hand, but, yeah. And then you could do it. So okay. level two. Level three means that you're, you're almost there without needing guidance. So you've been able to look at that, that uh, competency. You've been able to do the task, but you've actually had to ask one or two fundamental questions, mm -hmm. or you've needed to um, work through the process with, with quite a bit of guidance, but not as much as you would need yeah. at level two. Yeah. Now, there is a decision tree on Psyker's website, which I think makes it quite easy. And it also makes it quite a fair process. So the trainee can assess themselves against the, the decision tree. And whoever's reviewing their work would also be able to work through that decision tree and say, okay, are we, are we there? Mm. Level four is where you need to be on all of your tasks to be signed off. And that really means that you can do it on your own. You right. don't need guidance. I can just tell you, you need to go and do this. Off you go. You might ask one or two questions, but they're not fundamental to the task. Yes, right. Yeah. Same as you would do when you enter into a new job. You're expected to be able to, let's say, be a financial manager. But obviously, there are certain things you need to ask when you enter into something for the first yeah. time. You know, and that, that's natural. It, yeah. But it's not, it's not saying that you can't do the work. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, when, you're, when you're in articles and the value of a training contract is that your firm is very aware of all of these competencies that you need to be. So, and as you were talking earlier about your ANAs and your summit of assessments and your six month cycle, et cetera, within the training firm or within your training contract, you have these sit down meetings with, you know, with your training officer, or with your seniors, or whatever every six yeah. months and they go, they run through what you've been exposed to for those six months and then they'll rate you between one to four. And it's not about, um, you know, if, if you're able to, to do something at a level three in your first year, then that's fine. It's not like you're only going to be at a two in your first year and only going to be at a three. Um, so for me, for example, I had, um, I worked as a bookkeeper for eight years before I started my article. So I never had any, you know, I never had any RPL or, or whatever, but um, I was able to do a lot more stuff yeah. coming in. So I actually landed up with quite a lot of threes in my first year of, mm -hmm. um, of articles. Um, so the four is not about how long you've been doing it. The four is you're able to do it without your, you know, your handheld and the, you know, your, yeah. your partners and stuff feel that, as you say, although there may be questions of like, is this okay? You know, do we need to realign this to, do, it's not a case of like, if we leave her on her own, she's not going to be able to do it. No. You know, if we no. leave her on her own, she, you know, she'll run with it and she'll call us if necessary, but we don't have to worry. You know, we don't have to worry that the job is not going to be done kind of thing. Yeah. And the list of competencies for the different electives are on the cycle website, right? So if people yes. are looking for, okay. So if for someone who's looking and going, Oh, I wonder, you know, I wonder if I could consider this, I'll put the link into, to the different, you know, to the different competencies. Mm -hmm. But I think in terms of this, if you're moving from, a corporate space where you've never been exposed to this and you're thinking about this, understand that competencies are very practical yes. thing. Can you do it? You know, yeah. can, like, have you actually, are you actually able to do a tax return for a company <laughs> you know, on your exactly. own? You know, can you actually do this? Um, so, so that's very handy. Um, and again, when people email me, they're like, well, I've been working, you know, and, and I kind of need them to understand that it's not just I've been a financial manager. That's great. Can you break down what you've done and say, you know, I actually do compile the financial statements, I, you know, yes. I do tax returns, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not just about while I've been working. Exactly. You know, and I call myself a financial manager. Can you actually tick these boxes? So yes. that's, that's, that's really, really, that's really handy. Um, do you contact my 
past employers to verify this. If I go the exemption route, do you contact my past employers to verify what I've said I can do? So what you have to do as part of that exemption application is provide references. So it's actually corroborating information. You'll have someone who acts as your sponsor and they need to be a chartered accountant. And then you have other corroborators who will actually say, yes, this is what you actually did in those different roles that you played. So all of that information has to be provided to Psyche, yes. Okay, so again, if, I'm, if I don't want my employer to know, this is gonna be very tricky. This is going to be tricky. It's, going it's to be got tricky. to be transparent. It's a transparent process. Yeah. Okay. So I should, I'm going to be studying my PGDA. I'm going to be doing my ITC while I still work for this company. And as I go through the exemption process, um, when I go through the exemption process, they're going to have to know about it because they're going to need to be my reference to say, yes, this is, this is what she's done. And that person needs to be ACA. The, the sponsor needs to be the a sponsor. CA. The corroborators can be the people oh, who okay. work. Yes. So how would I go about finding a sponsor? Or who does it need to be someone that knows me? Now like, that's a, it definitely needs to be somebody who knows you because they've got to vouch for you. That's okay. effectively what the sponsor is doing is they're okay. vouching for you. So if um, I have a friend who's a CA, would I, would I use them or should it be someone on a more professional there are a list of exclusions in terms of who okay. cannot be your sponsor, and that includes somebody like your spouse, which seems to happen quite regularly. I um, imagine it does. <laughs> I imagine it does. Yeah. And it can be tricky if you're in a family business, but um, so there's a list of exclusions. I'm afraid I don't know them off the top of my head. I don't deal directly with the exemption route, so I've, okay. my information okay. is probably more high level, but I can provide all of that information if you need it. Yeah, well, I think to, uh, in. Uh, at the moment, the starting point, I think, is just to start the conversation for people to, yeah. to kind of give them a better impression. Because as I say, like I, I get so many emails from people and, and they think that the way it works is that they'll send a letter to you mm -hmm. and say, um, you know, this, I've been working as a financial manager and this is what I do. So mm -hmm. can you give me my, um, you know, can you give me my stuff? And, you know, I'm going to keep it all quiet you know, yeah. until, until I've actually got it done. So I think the understanding that it is a very formal process, no. you know, you do have to prove stuff. It's not just, you yes. know, it is, 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 is very, very, is very valuable. And you say, this is, this is not a, this is not like a three month process. No, it takes, it takes a while to put that portfolio together for an exemption application. We only have two windows each year. So you have to oh. either put, put in, in March or in August, okay. uh, you've got about 15 days, that the window is open and you submit your, your application. And then it takes about four months before you get an answer. So the August applications, the answer will come out in December. So it's quite mm -hmm. a lengthy um, assessment process. It goes through moderation, it goes through a number of different committees before you get the final go ahead. So Psyche takes it very seriously. If you want to bypass the training contract route, which is the route that we monitor and we, we, we look at regularly, we need to be absolutely sure that we can put you out there as a CA without yeah. having gone through our formal qualification. Route. Right. Yeah. And you, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's really, I think it's really important for people to understand the formality behind, you know, behind the process doing, if you've never been part of that world, doing articles is not just working for an audit firm. You know, it's, it's a very specific, you come in with a set of criteria and outcomes that you have to have achieved by the end of those three years, if you've got your degree or five years, if you, know, if, if you don't have your degree. So it's not work experience. It's very specific. I need to have done this. Um, and your, your electives are like your majors, if you will. Like, yes. Um, so your electives, one of them has to be accounting because you are going to be a chartered so accountant. So that's a, that's a compulsory <laughs> skill. It's not elective yeah. at all. Compulsory. So yeah, that's, that's your compulsory. So that like, you don't get out of doing accounting. Then you have electives, which you can, it's kind of like choosing your majors. I, I want to choose, you know, I want to do tax and auditing, for example. And then your residuals are, you don't, you don't need as many competencies. So for me, if I'm, you know, I don't, I don't ever want to be a tax specialist, I might not choose that as my elective. Mm -hmm. Then there's some, you know, I do need to prove some residual skills, like some, but it's not, it's not, at, it's not at the same level. 
So again, I'm going to put I'm going to put a link to the competencies and, and, and that whole framework of the electives and the residuals and stuff, so people can actually take take a look at that for for, for themselves. Um, so I just want to also point out yes. that you you cannot choose your elective. Your elective is determined by the office that you go into. Yes. So that's by right. way of choice, you would need to choose an office that's that correct. offers yeah. the elective that you're looking for. Right. So right. the most common one is external audit. The bulk of our training offices are audit practices mm. but we do have over a hundred um, offices that offer alternative electives now um, and sometimes more than one elective mm. so also just just to just to make yes, that very right. clear because yeah. we do get applicants going in and then they like but I thought I could choose tax and my office doesn't offer tax right so yeah yeah you, you make a very good point when when you are when you are going through your article process not all uh, training officers are going to offer the same experience one and two the elect if you know if, if you work for someone who doesn't specialize in tax at all then you can't you know you can't have tax as an elective because you're not going to get that experience so yeah you make a very good point that's going to be highly dependent on what the firm that you apply for what they're able to offer you in terms of experience because they also have to have the entire infrastructure and set up to monitor give you exposure to at all the right levels, et cetera, for, for that. So that, 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 that makes it incredibly important. Um, if, if you could say to, um, if you had advice for, for a couple of different groups of people, because these are, you know, these are the people that, are, that I deal with. <laughs> to someone who's kind of going, I'll do my articles later. Yeah. You know, I'm kind of doing the studying now, but life is kind of getting, and I don't, you know, I, I, can't, I can't really, kind of maybe can't quite really afford to, I don't really want to do it now. So I'll just get work experience and do, you know, do the exemption process later. So for someone who's kind of going, I don't really want to do my articles right now. I'll go through an RPL or go through an exemption process later. What advice do you have for them? The quickest route to qualification is a training contract. I can't stress that enough. Really? Um, it really is the quickest way. And the earlier you do it, the better mm. it, get it out the way so that that is always my my advice i understand though that that's not always available no. to everyone and yeah. you know yeah. from a from a financial perspective or for you know other reasons you might find yourself not in a training contract up front so there are these alternative routes but they are not as straightforward as a training contract yeah. Yeah. i think that's just you need to understand and make an, you know a, an informed decision when you're doing that that by bypassing the training contract, you actually may not be able to qualify, first of mm. all, as quickly, and secondly, with as much certainty. Mm. And you might still, at the end of the day, be told you need to go back into a training contract. Right. So just to understand that that is a possibility. Yeah, right. So do you, do you, see, a lot of, uh, do you see a lot of exemption applications that, you know, that, that end up kind of like actually you need to go you need to go back and do your your training contract do you see that happen quite a lot where people think that they would be exempt so i i think it often gets um that gets i'm going to say weeded out at the at the application phase because right. as the applicant works through the exemption form they, they realize, realize they can't even put the application yeah. in uh, they yeah. just don't have the competencies right so you need to think very carefully about it so if it is something that you're thinking about, it, it is worth contacting Psyche and asking for the most current forms. Also understanding yeah. that our competency framework shifts over time. True. So what we had in 2010 changed in 2016, and it's going to change again in 2022. And mm -hmm. it's going to be quite a dramatic change in 2022. Yes. Yes. So just to understand that things are shifting constantly right. and that extension will keep being updated. So at the point when you inquire, you might get one set of information, but by the mm. time it actually comes to putting in your application, it might look quite different. Right. Whereas the, the training contract will take you through that process. And if yeah. there's a shift in competency frame, there's always a transitional yeah. arrangement. So yeah. the training office will take you through that transition. Right. So yeah, yeah. You, you need to think very carefully before you decide that right. exemption is the route. We have had a few applicants. Um, so I'm actually just going to take us back a step. Mm. There are different routes into exemption. So what I've given you is the standard route. It's available to anybody, 72 months experience, ITC. But if you have another qualification, so for example, right. you've already done SEMA, you're a registered ACMA, mm. there are also options for you, depending on how much post, 
post-qualification for SEMA means post-registration. So you've been an ACMA for 10 years. Right. You can apply for exemption and you might not even have to write um, the APC. So I think there's, they, there are different routes for yes. different qualifications. Yes. We have reciprocity agreements with different organizations, mm -hmm. for example, ICAEW, SEMA, um, ACCA, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. we would always look at what the underlying qualification is mm -hmm. and then give you advice based on your circumstances. Yeah. So let's say that you've come through the, the SEMA route so in addition to the 72 months and all of that, you've actually got a lot more experience. We would recognize that in processing your exemption application. Yeah, yeah. But and I think the, the, profession, the profession route is a slightly different one because all professions require a certain amount of, or all professions require, you know, certain competencies. They may call it whatever the case is. But part of a being a profession is that you have evidence that you're able to do certain things at certain levels for different professions. Yes. So it's a lot easier to prove if you've come out of a different profession that you're able to do stuff. The question is, is it the same stuff at the same level that you know that's 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 needed for that's needed for for here. Um, and I think, as I say, most, you know, yeah, most of the, most of the people that, that, that talk to me are not, are not professionals at all. You know, they're not coming from a different professional background there. Um, what, what, what I like about what you're saying and what I think is really valuable for, for people is that um, they have a lot, you know, there's, there's a lot more ability for them to assess for themselves. I think mm. to some extent, people are under the impression that they'll just have to apply, send you a whole bunch of stuff, their CV and, you know, <laughs> and then, you know, you'll work your magic and whatever in the background and then they'll wait to hear from you. So I think the valuable thing here is if you think you're in this position, just get those application forms. And by yes. going through those, you'll be able to assess for yourself what the chances are and how much of that stuff you can, you know, you can actually do. So there's a lot more control, you know, you're, it's, it's, it's something you're going to be able to, to assess for yourself far more than just sort of a passive process of, well, I'm just waiting to hear from, I'm waiting to hear from Saika. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's active. You've got to be involved. If you are bypassing three years of development with a training office, yeah. it's not, it's not just a, an email. Yeah. 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 I think the, the common misunderstanding or the common perception I think that people have is that the, the level or the hierarchy that I've, I've worked at and the amount of years of experience in, in an office or in a, you know, is, is the value, you know, so I've been, you know, working at this level for five years or 10 years or whatever the case is. So therefore I should. And I think the, what I'm trying to get people to understand is it's not about the length of how long you've been doing something for. It's about whether or not you can, quite frankly, tick off all those competencies, you know, so if you've been a financial manager for 10 years, but all you've done, for example, is compile financial statements, that's fantastic, very happy for you. But then what about, you know, all the other, all yeah. the other competencies, then, you know, you're in that position. So I think what I don't, what people don't understand is that there's a very specific set of, you have to be able to do this, you have to be able to do that, and you have to be able to do it on your own. The, the profession is not trying to exclude people right. from qualifying. The profession is not trying to say you're not good enough or our way is the only way or whatever the case is. The profession is trying to ensure that anybody who carries those four letters has been proven to be able to do certain things at certain levels. Right. And that is, a very, that is a very important responsibility that the profession has for all these reasons that everybody wants to get into the profession. <laughs> you know, that's why everybody wants to be part of the profession is because you're able to do all these things, but the profession is not trying to exclude you because you didn't do their articles. You know, that's not, that's not what's going on here. It's if you're able to prove that you're capable of doing these things that someone would have done at their training contract, then, then, then you're good. You know, that's, yeah. That's, that's the thing. So again, I, when I, you know, when I ask these questions, it's based on the types of things that I'm, you know, that I hear from, from students and from people, mm -hmm. people studying. And I think um, the really valuable components from this one is go and get that application form and see for yourself. Mm -hmm. That's great. So mm -hmm. you don't have to put the application and then wonder. Um, mm -hmm. And number two, if you are looking for the exemption route, finish your ITC. 
you know, get, yes. get the ITC sorted and then, you know, then we'll have the discussion. But that doesn't matter whether you can get exemption if you don't have the ITC, that's, you know, mm. that's not going to happen. And the reality is that's generally your barrier to entry. PGDA is mm. generally your barrier to entry anyway. So focus on your studying, finish ITC, and then we'll talk about exemption. We'll talk yeah. about the exemption process after, mm. after that.